welcome you to the afternoon session. And I'm Brian Rayner and my co-chair, Dr. Peter Libby. And I'll be introducing the first speaker, um, who is Dr. Walter Willett, who's Professor of Epidemiology and Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health and Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Willett has been studying diet tree approaches to major diseases for over 35 years, and he's applied these methods both to the Nurses Health Studies 1 and 2 and the Health Professionals Follow-up Study, together studying over 300,000 men and women. He's published over 1,800 articles, and he's one of the top three cited individuals in the areas of science. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce an, an expert in this field to talk on steps to control obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Does the food industry have a role? Dr. Willett, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I should warn you, though, that actually I've never given a talk on this topic before. Does the industry have a role? And I don't have any data on the topic, so bear with me. I'll try to say something about this. Uh, it is uh, always a great pleasure to be here in London and see colleagues with whom I've not interacted with for, uh, for a while. Uh, uh, to start off with, you've probably uh, heard about the trip that David took to the United States a couple of years ago, uh, that he was loaned from the academy in, uh, in uh, Tuscany. But uh, and during his two years, a funny thing happened on the way to Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 Dr. McGregor I, I indicated that, in fact, this was brought to you by fast food companies. And I'm sure that was a contributing factor. Actually, I don't know who one made this wonderful uh, picture here. I, I can't acknowledge uh, the, somebody I don't know. It wasn't mine. But it, uh, we tr really do have a problem. But I think it is probably a little bit more nuanced than just simply fast food being the, the whole issue. And uh, this is essentially the diagnosis by a senior economist at Harvard University. And I would say this not is a pinko lefty guy that he was actually the former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, but I'll read it even though I know you know how to read. Uh, big agriculture gets paid for growing the corn, often subsidized by the government, and the food processors get paid for adding tons of chemicals to create a habit-forming and thus irresistible product. Along the way, scientists get paid for finding just the right mix of salt, sugar, and chemicals to make the latest instant food maximally addictive. Advertisers get paid for peddling it, and in the end, the healthcare industry makes a fortune treating the disease that inevitably results. So from an economist standpoint, this is working perfectly. Uh, of course, the problem is from the standpoint of the population and individual's health, this is not working so perfectly, and hence the, the fate of David. Uh, and the health, the healthcare industry, I think, does, uh, I think, uh, is not dealing with this in the way that uh, would be maximally effective. And I think uh, the, some of the perspectives provided yesterday by Dr. McCray are right. We really uh, don't start early enough. We don't deal with the underlying causes. Uh, <clears throat> And I was just, the last talk did trouble me a little bit. I didn't have a chance to say something, but uh, it does seem like we really are out of balance that all I heard about was drugs. And drugs, uh, drug deficiency is not the cause of coronary heart disease. Uh, and uh, diet and lifestyle were sort of dismissed. And uh, in fact, The Lancet did publish a paper a few years ago, the Leon Heart Study, which showed that uh, diet alone in that randomized trial among people post-MI did reduce recurrent MI and death by 70%, which is far greater than anything we've seen here presented. Uh, and uh, I've seen nothing to refute that. I th probably with more uh, pharmacology in the background, uh, in effect, might, would be less, given that a lot of pathways are drugged already, but still, there. Uh, it's very likely that 
there's still a large effect. And I'm not, yeah, that study has not been refuted or replicated. It should be, but uh, in fact, it hasn't really been taken seriously. And I, I would ask, since I have the chance, uh, uh, there are a lot of cardiologists in the room, uh, and well, anybody can answer this question, but uh, how many of you really know just what your patient is eating on or uh, routinely on, a, on uh, of those you see? Yeah, it, that, that's a sad reality that I did, I had uh, atrial fibrillation and a pulmonary embolus and I was treated very well at the Brigham, uh, but um, I, in the forms that are uh, required, to, that we were required to fill out before seeing the physician, it, it asked about drugs, um, alcohol, smoking, but nothing about diet at all. So. I think it's, we really can't say it's, it, we're, diet is not working, our patients don't adhere to it, when in fact we don't even know what they're eating. And usually, if anything, do, do nothing, or at the most, just you know, follow this or follow that and, and goodbye. And it's not surprising that uh, if patients are not following uh, a diet that really could be helping them. But that's, uh, so there is room for, uh, I think creating a, a practice that is better balanced, and that might be the topic to discuss at another time. But uh, my work is primarily looking at underlying causes, diet and lifestyle in particular, relating to cardiovascular disease, disease uh, diabetes, cancer, uh, it really pretty much everything that happens to people. And we like to think that if we do the science well, there's a straight line to policy. But this is more the reality that, uh, and in the food industry, the, the topic of this talk has a lot to do with uh, deviations, uh, sort of dead ends in, in places, uh, and, uh, and delays and distractions that happen along the way from uh, science to policy. Uh, as an example, I will, where I've had probably the most experience is on trans fat reduction. Uh, the background of this goes back to the 1970s in terms of seriously looking at trans fat, although it's the actual uh, discovery of how to make trans fat was in the early 1900s, and someone got, someone got a Nobel Prize for this, in fact, but then it was actually introduced in the food supply uh, in a major way, even uh, by 1915, 1920, and continued to increase uh, throughout the first half of uh, the last century. Uh, these are 60 pound blocks of trans fat that I bought at a restaurant supply store, basically partially hydrogenated soybean oil. And you'd never see these going to a restaurant, but this is what virtually every restaurant in the United States was using and in much of Europe as well for deep frying. They would put them in the fry lighters and uh, heat them up to 450 degrees and say cooked in vegetable oil, but at room temperature here, it's um, solid, you can do sculpture with it, you can build buildings with it, uh, lots of things. But the question is, what does it do to our arteries? And this did become uh, of concern to me back in the late 70s when it was realized, it was becoming very clear that the essential fatty acids that comprise most of liquid ve vegetable oils like corn oil or soybean oil are the precursors of eicosanoids and a whole uh, array of really critical biological molecules that control inflammation, thrombosis, many other functions. And we were twisting those molecules in not just trace amounts, in uh, many gram quantities per day in our food, in our diets. And that twisting that created trans fat was almost sure going to change the function of those critical biological molecules. Uh, so right from the beginning, <coughs> We've looked at this in, in our cohort studies. Uh, and what we've done, in fact, more broadly, what I realized in the uh, late 1970s was that uh, we were telling people to eat this or not eat that uh, with strong dietary recommendations, and you started to scratch the surface, and there was virtually no science to back up any of those uh, recommendations. We were telling people to avoid eggs, not a single study had shown that people who ate more eggs had higher risk of coronary heart disease. And in fact, still not a single study is done. We have a lot of data now, and 
we don't see that they're the problem which we had thought them to be, although still maybe not an optimal breakfast. But trans fat was, in looking at possible aspects of diet, that was something we wanted to study. So beginning in 1980, we, uh, those red triangles there, we started collecting dietary data and have repeated that over time because uh, we get the best ascertainment of diet by repeated uh, measurements. And diet has changed a lot over time, both uh, on an individual basis because people's choices and preferences change, but also uh, because uh, the food supply is changing. So in these long-term studies, we can adjust for uh, potential confounding variables like uh, smoking and physical activity if we want to look at something like trans fat. And uh, we do document incident cases of heart disease with medical records and monitor mortality statistics. So um, after eight years, uh, we had enough cases uh, at that time, about 500 uh, cases of uh, acute MI or fatal coronary heart disease and uh, took a first look at trans fat and did see a strong positive association. There are about 80% higher risk among those with consistently high trans fat intake in their diet. And I'm grateful to The Lancet for publishing this because the New England Journal and JAMA rejected it. And Lancet was willing to take on some sort of fringy articles at that time. Uh, but of course, replication is important. So. Uh, with 14 years of follow-up, the New England Journal did publish uh, this more comprehensive look. Uh, this is about 1,000 incident cases of uh, acute MI or uh, coronary death. And uh, Frank Hu led these analyses. Uh, and it, uh, what we saw here is uh, looking at different types of fat in the diet. Uh, and each type compared to the same number of calories from carbohydrate that again, trans fat really stuck out. It was by far most strongly associated with coronary heart disease risk. Um, and, but uh, saturated fat was only very weakly related to heart disease risk compared to carbohydrate. Uh, however, monounsaturated fat and especially polyunsaturated fats were strongly inversely related to risk of coronary heart disease. So total fat was unrelated to heart disease. It was really the type of fat. And as you could see by this, and I should mention this was confirmed in, in other prospective studies, that, that if you wanted to re reduce heart disease risk, presumably you would really eliminate trans fat and then replace some of the saturated fat. You can't replace it all because it's intrinsic to so many foods, but some of it with a mix of mono and polyunsaturated fats in the diet. Uh, at, the same, at the same time, colleagues in uh, the Netherlands uh, Drs. Mensik and Katan did a controlled feeding study that was uh, published also in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, in, this is, you take a few dozen people and you really control their diets and feed them for just here three weeks at a time. And what they found was that trans fat did increase LDL cholesterol on a gram for gram basis, uh, very similar to saturated fat, uh, but unlike any other type of fat in the diet, HDL, uh, HDL went down with trans fat, and the LDL HDL, LDL HDL ratio was about twice as bad on trans fat compared to saturated fat. And other uh, controlled feeding studies, there are probably more than a dozen now, confirmed this finding and also showed that trans fat uh, had lots of other adverse effects as well. It increased uh, triglycerides, increased inflammatory factors, increase the proportion of uh, small, dense uh, LDL particles. It really exacerbates everything we think is part of the metabolic syndrome in an important way. Uh, this is a <clears throat> meta-analysis we uh, uh, put together. The uh, uh, solid line uh, is uh, essentially the uh, fit through uh, data points for trans fat intake, uh, looking at the change in LDL, HDL ratio, and this is saturated fat for, again, showing that uh, putting a lot of data together that trans fat was considerably worse than saturated fat in, in the diet. So what about the food industry? Um, I think my experience has been that first, it's basically not monolithic, and there's some better players and there's some really pretty evil players. 
in, in the food industry. Uh, and I, I must acknowledge that uh, on the trans fat issue, this seemed to split pretty much uh, uh, by the Atlantic Ocean. That at the time we were publishing this and this information on trans fat was uh, becoming available, uh, all the major margarine makers in the United States were owned by tobacco companies. And you can just imagine that healthfulness was not high on their agenda. And so they basically, as one colleague said, uh, hired lawyers and PR people to discredit the findings and, um, and, and uh, really dismiss them. Whereas in, in Europe, actually the major margarine manufacturers, uh, Unilever in particular, did take the evidence seriously. They, as my colleague said, hired uh, biochemists and food technologists and figured out how to make margarines without trans fat in them. So uh, this is one example. The, it's not a Unilever brand, but it actually is, was made by Unilever and is uh, essentially trans-free. Uh, and that was really important because the American manufacturers could no longer say it's impossible uh, when somebody actually is doing it. And within a few years, pretty much all the major margarines uh, became trans-free. Um, but the food industry, we've really had to sort of fight at least part of them step by step. Uh, it, it took us about 10 years to get trans fat on the food label. So there is a line for trans fat on, our, on anything that is packaged now in the United States. And as Dr. McGregor said, this was to have to declare it, it was a huge incentive to reformulate. So uh, almost overnight, and the food industry managed to delay this by about 10 years after uh, we, petitions were out and uh, some of the advocacy groups uh, lobbied and uh, finally the planets aligned right and it happened that the FDA did uh, require this to be on the label. And almost overnight, everything was trans-free once it had to be there. But a, lo uh, a lot of the uh, foods don't have a label. And uh, in, in particular, if you go to a restaurant, the foods don't have label. So even though uh, by this time, uh, every dietary guideline said trans fat intake should be as low as possible, and the FDA requ required it to be on the label because of adverse effects, restaurants were still just serving it because they didn't have to declare it. And so finally, um, uh, New York City, uh, Boston here, this is an announcement of that back in 2008, uh, did ban trans fats, partly hydrogenated vegetable oils in restaurants. And uh, this happened not at a national level, but city by city, state by state. And finally, the food uh, service industry suppliers uh, decided they couldn't have a patchwork distribution system and just decided that everybody will just get transfree cooking oils. Uh, so that, that has happened uh, by now. Uh, and uh, New York was one of the leaders under uh, uh, the Mayor Bloomberg at that time who really understood uh, the priority of uh, public health. Uh, and with follow-up, by 94% of the restaurants very quickly were uh, trans-free when they looked at them. Uh, but yet, uh, there, are still pr there were still products out there in the grocery store shelves uh, that had trans fat. And uh, essentially, this is a New York Times editorial from uh, 2005, as things now stand. The FDA acknowledges that trans fats are unhealthy at any level and yet maintains that partially hydrogenated oils that contain them are, are basically safe. And the agency really can't have it both ways. So they were uh, really resisted uh, essentially banning trans fat. And partially, and I think one of the stories here is that at least in the US, and this may not apply elsewhere, we, are, we have so much inertia and gridlock at the national level and the food, major food industries are so powerful at the national level that it's actually very difficult to get anything done. Uh, but states and local uh, environments, we can actually do a lot more. And if we, there starts to be a point where enough, enough cities and enough states uh, enact legislation, policies, 
uh, then that's a tipping point and it happens across the board. And that's happened to cigarette smoking too, that we still have no national ban on smoking in restaurants. It's all state by state and there are some southern states where you can still go, go in and get your lungs full of, of tobacco smoke. So finally, uh, as of uh, July this year, trans fats will be banned nationally uh, in the United States. So just to uh, show what, what's happened uh, is that uh, we start off there with the epidemiology on the left side, uh, back our first Lancet paper. We also showed uh, clear relationships with uh, type 2 diabetes, and there was this another parallel line of work uh, looking with controlled feeding studies looking at what happens at intermediate risk factors. And there, uh, there's never been a randomized trial, and I think this serves as an, exa as an example where you can come to a high enough level of certainty about causality without randomized trials. And in general, for most questions about foods or uh, diet, it's actually going to be very difficult or impossible to do ra randomized trials with clin clinical endpoints because of issues of duration, how many years does it take, uh, adherence over a long time is uh, typically very difficult. And confounding, even in a randomized trials, people don't just change one factor in their diet in isolation. They automatically uh, change uh, lots of other things in their diet. So this combination, though, where we have rep replicated uh, longitudinal studies uh, and controlled feeding studies of intermediate endpoints really sh uh, with concurrent kind of evidence really can make a very strong case and, and uh, that has been the basis of policy. And so, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, supermarket products, the trans fat levels came down very dramatically. Uh, restaurants, after the restaurant ban, uh, uh, trans fat levels came down very dramatically. Uh, we uh, looked at uh, trans fat uh, uh, intake um, uh, using the NHANES data in the United States and uh, FDA data. There was about a 70% reduction uh, by 2010. Uh, the NHANES survey, of, uh, basically our national survey, showed about a 70% reduction in trans fat levels in the blood. And also, uh, HDL went up, LDL went down, and it wasn't just statins because the same thing happened in children as well. And more recently, there's been some evidence. This is from uh, New York City, uh, New York State counties that uh, banned trans fat in restaurants have had a more rapid decline in uh, hospitalizations for coronary heart disease compared to counties that did not ban. But of course, all of them were getting the benefits of trans fat being removed from margarines and other products. So uh, that's been a success story, uh, but it could have happened a lot faster if there had not been industry obstruction. On the other hand, there were parts of the industry that really were helpful by taking the initiative, responding to the science, and the fact that they could then label their products as tra no trans fat really helped to create public awareness in this area. Uh, Dr. McGregor talked a little bit about sugar-sweetened beverages yesterday, and there has been a huge increase in the United States uh, since the United, 1970s. During that time, we've added about three to 400 calories to our, our intake per person on a daily basis, and it, uh, uh, that sugar-sweetened beverages account for about half of that excess uh, caloric intake. So this is, there are many factors that are contributing to the increase in obesity, but probably the single most important factor has been sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. And here uh, we have an example of a really bad actor, is uh, not just Coca-Cola, probably the worst, but the whole sugar-sweetened beverage industry. And they've used all the tactics that uh, Dr. McGregor uh, described and more. Uh, they've created front organizations and run full page ads about uh, Committee for Freedom and things like this, and is claiming this is going to cause, if we have tax uh, on sugar sweetened beverages, it'll cause job loss. loss. It will especially uh, discriminate among low income persons. Uh, so they've run very powerful, very expensive, uh, well-crafted campaigns that way. Uh, they've also funded a number of people in the scientific community to do really terrible little uh, 
studies that are almost bound to give you misleading results. And then they've funded people to do meta-analyses that included a lot of these terrible little studies. And then they've even funded someone to do a meta-analysis of meta-analyses of these uh, really bad studies. Uh, and really to top it off, they, uh, they, they used distraction. And uh, New York Times had a piece uh, last year, uh, it was, uh, this was uh, before last year, a couple of years ago. Uh, essentially, one of the distractions has been to claim that, uh, emphasize inactivity is really the source of obesity, nothing to do with Coca-Cola or anything like that. And so uh, they set up, a, again, a front organization led by some of the senior people in the uh, U.S. nutrition community at the University of Colorado. Uh, and uh, this was called Global Energy Balance Network. And uh, it promoted the idea that essentially weight conscious uh, Americans are over fixated on how much they eat while not paying enough attention to exercise. And it was really the exercise that was the issue. Uh, the Sort of the nail that uh, in the coffin that caused the University of Colorado to uh, essentially give the money back to Coca-Cola when it was found that the website for this organization was actually on the Coca-Cola server. And the claim was that uh, the, the scientists didn't have enough expertise to uh, set up their own website, which <laughs> questions their science a little bit. Uh, so despite all the obstruction and pushback from the soda industry, we've actually had some uh, reasonable success that soda consumption has come down, uh, regular soda, uh, uh, and uh, diet soda has gone down slightly as well. But this is about a 25% uh, decrease in soda consumption, which we've done some calculations, is preventing uh, a lot of, uh, in many cases of type 2 diabetes and um, uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, it's, obviously, it's still way too high, but uh, the, the uh, direction is, uh, is positive. Now, uh, this decrease has really sent panic uh, in the Coca-Cola uh, headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, and they've had a lot of layoffs and things, but their response has been exactly what tobacco did, go global. And uh, they are pushing, uh, they see the, the low and middle income countries as their future. So uh, this is in China. Of course, the messages are the same that uh, if, uh, drinking a lot of Coke makes you uh, athletic, it um, makes you have friends, it it's, it's, uh, it has a very positive spin to it, uh, but it, of course it doesn't talk about diabetes, blindness, amputation, all the things that come along with it. And uh, India uh, as well, uh, that uh, Coca-Cola is, uh, was announced they were spending $5 billion just in India to promote Coca-Cola consumption. So uh, these, it turns out, it's, I think most are aware, are vulnerable populations where in many places the rates of diabetes have already exceeded uh, substantially rates of diabetes in the United States. And this is going to exacerbate them. So how do we deal with industry where there is a complex relationship and uh, essentially academics can become corrupted even uh, and, uh, uh, and essentially providing misleading information. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's important to talk to uh, people in the industry and interact so that they do have the best available evidence to them and the people who want to do the right thing uh, can have the information to do the right thing. Uh, one of the ways we've, that I felt very comfortable is working with another institution, the Culinary Institute of America, where we have a program every year uh, that uh, in California at their uh, education center uh, where uh, the heads of major food services in the United States and uh, major uh, food providers like Starbucks, uh, Marriott Hotel and others are invited uh, the uh, 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 money for the conference does come from uh, some of the food industries, although there's uh, um, criteria for have, uh, healthfulness, and uh, participants in our department are not involved any, in any way in the financial part of it. So that has provided a, a way that's, I think, worked for us to interact and provide uh, information without being financially 
uh, connected uh, with, uh, with the industry. So in general, that's been, uh, I think, a really good interaction. And uh, we have seen a big, really directly because of this, in many companies, a big increase in whole grain consumption, some reduction in soda, quite a bit of effort in reducing sugar-sweetened beverage uh, consumption by providing alternative kinds of beverages. So the, I wanted to touch just a little bit in the last few minutes on the, the role of science, because I think our own community in nutrition and uh, cardiovascular disease prevention more broadly uh, has not served the, uh, the public very well in some cases, uh, partly because of uh, uh, strong recommendations where we really had very limited data and sometimes just not even paying attention to the data that we have had in an adequate way. Uh, this is the 1992 Food Guide Pyramid from the United States. And uh, this has been, lots of countries just translated it. And uh, so this had a big influence even beyond the United States. And the message at that time was that we should avoid all fats uh, of all kinds, oils and, and fats. Uh, and of course, if you're not going to consume fat, you have to eat a lot of carbohydrate. And we were told we could have up to 11 servings of carbohydrate a day with, uh, without paying attention to the type of carbohydrate. And uh, they even put potatoes there with a vegetable, so you could have up to 13 servings of starch a day. And that was said to be a good thing. And there was never any evidence to support that it was uh, based on uh, very minimal cross-country correlations of, that were known to be very weak kind of evidence and a few animal studies. So, but that did really become uh, the, uh, the conventional wisdom that fat is bad. And for those who say people don't pay attention, fat intake did go from about 42% of energy in the United States down to about 33 percentage of energy from United, uh, from 33% of calories from fat. Uh, during that period. So it was a big shift in diet with a lot of increase in carbohydrate intake. And um, almost surely that did contribute to the, uh, the gain in obesity and diabetes that we've had. It's obviously hard to totally dissect out all the causes because a lot of things are going on in parallel. Uh, but uh, I, by this time, I think uh, in the scientific era, we have shifted that a message away uh, toward focusing on the, the type of fat and the type of carbohydrate in the diet. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. I just don't have time to go into that. But then, all of a sudden, butter is back. And where did, where did that come from? And uh, I think probably a lot of, I got emails from around the world and uh, a lot of people express, expressing confusion. Uh, we were told that, uh, uh, saturated fat and animal fats were not so good for us, and now this is back. Uh, it, it the, the main uh, source of this, the source of that article in particular, and a lot of other articles, was this meta-analysis in the Annals of Internal Medicine from a group here in the UK, basically saying that current evidence does not clearly support cardiovascular guidelines that encourage high consumption of polyunsaturated fatty acids and low consumption of total saturated fats. And of course, journalists love this. Oh, scientists got it all wrong for years. Uh, uh, you can't believe anything uh, from the scientific community. And the public was left very confused. And not just uh, the public. My dean called me up that next morning, says, what's going on? Um, and uh, I think uh, any, uh, most practitioners who thought at all about diet were, not, were certainly confused by this as well. So this was uh, just a horrendous meta-analysis uh, that uh, published in a prestigious place. Uh, but there were just layers of mistakes here that I, I knew something was wrong. It took me about 30 seconds to realize that. And they had, from the nurse's health study, they had actually pulled out the relative risk from the wrong endpoint, from the wrong paper, even. And there were just other layers and layers of problems with this. But the most fundamental was that they actually it didn't look at replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat because you can't actually do that from the published uh, 
studies. They, the analyses were in everything except our own paper had not actually looked at that substitution of polyunsaturated fat for saturated fat. However, this paper also ignored the fact that uh, Dr. Ascario, uh, about eight years earlier, had gotten the primary data from all the large cohort studies that were available and did that analysis and found that there was lower risk of, sat of polyunsaturated fat replacing saturated fat. And that wasn't even mentioned uh, in this. Uh, and it really, this really does require getting the primary data, not just the published results in the paper. Uh, so uh, very troublesome. This was uh, essentially looking that from that meta uh, analysis of combined cohort data uh, published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, uh, 2009. Uh, if saturated fat is replaced by carbohydrate, there was no reduction in risk, in fact, a slight increase in risk here. But uh, if it was replaced by a polyunsaturated fat, there was a significantly lower risk of, of uh, coronary heart disease, very consistent with what we've known for 50 years about the effects of types of fat on blood lipids. Uh, and I think this, uh, without going into many different studies here, does summarize what we, uh, again, layers of evidence show that, uh, and those layers of evidence include the controlled feeding studies looking at lipid fractions, includes the long-term epidemiologic studies, and includes some older randomized controlled trials as well that were fairly small, but uh, do show that replacing saturated fat with you know, polyunsaturated fat does increase risk. So the whole issue about saturated fat depends on the comparison, and that's really fundamental in nutrition, that if you're going to increase or decrease a macronutrient, you're going to replace it with something else. And, it, and that's really analogous to if you're conducting a controlled feeding study, you always have to think about what you're feeding to the control group, and your results will defend, depend a lot on what your control group is. So if you replace saturated fat with trans fat, then actually, uh, or if you replace uh, trans fat with saturated fat, that will reduce risk. Uh, and the, if you replace saturated fat with carbohydrates in general, that has pretty neutral impact on heart disease risk. But if you replace uh, saturated fat with refined starch and sugar, there's some increase in, with whole grains, some decrease. But most importantly, uh, the evidence is overwhelming. Again, these layers of evidence that if unsaturated fat uh, vegetable oils replace saturated fat, that will reduce risk of coronary heart disease. So to conclude, uh, I think uh, while there are some, the fast food industry is out there, there are s some parts of the food industry that are providing healthy products and uh, trying to do the right thing. It's not monolithic. Uh, it's best to work most closely with those parts of the industry that are not tied to specific products, such as grocery retailers and food services, There's, because they have options. They're not tied to one specific uh, product. As a scientific community, we need to strive to base our guidelines on the best available evidence. They're, it will never be perfect, and we always need to work to make it better. And I think, uh, this is a bit of a side comment, but meta-analyses are out of control and need additional layers of review. Uh, especially the problem is that anybody with an internet connection can do a meta-analysis and you really need to know and understand the definitions of the outcome. You need to understand the exposure variable. Uh, and probably we need some sort of another level of check such as uh, confirming with the authors of the primary study that their data were properly represented. This is more a comment to Richard Horton, I guess. So thank you.